Last week, I was invited to be part of a discrete webinar where four of us brainstormed about the conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia in the South Caucasus. Of compelling interest to our conversations were two distinct items. The first was the dramatic ramping up of tensions in the Davush region in southern Armenia, around villages like Voskepar, Baranis, and Berkaper, and the peremptory demand by President Aliyev for Armenia to return a number of villages to Azerbaijan. Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan hasn't said no, but has seemingly emitted a qualified yes. The second topic we discussed was the warming of relations between Armenia and the West at the expense of relations with the Russian Federation. Many observers refer to this as a pivot. This has led to a war of words between Russia and Armenia over issues such as the CSTO collective defense agreement, the Russian military presence in Gumri, or more broadly, the direction of travel for Armenian foreign policy. In fact, our quadripartite webinar took place purposefully on the very day that US Secretary of State, the President of the EU Commission, and the Prime Minister of Armenia met in Brussels to discuss economic cooperation, humanitarian aid, and democratic resilience, but purportedly not military matters. As some of you already know, one of my dissertations during my postgraduate law courses was on alternative dispute resolution, ADR if you prefer. It focused on the international principles of conflict resolution in Nagorno-Karabakh. My work won many plaudits, thankfully, and His Holiness Catholicos Karikin I, a dear friend and wonderful pastor, who was for a few short years the supreme head of the Armenian Orthodox Church at Holy H. Miyadzin prior to his premature death from cancer, decided that he'd publish it in Armenia. My study is now, of course, outdated, but I've nonetheless followed quite studiously the fate of those three million Armenians in this volatile and tense region. So having set out the parameters of this episode, I'll now opine on how Armenia could proceed with its foreign policy initiatives in the face of this crisis, minus any bombastic pretensions. So here are my guidelines for what I deem are the logistical, military, and political consequences. My guidelines tend to seek the bumpy middle road, but you can, of course, ignore them maybe at your peril. Armenia and Armenians in the diaspora should acknowledge openly that diplomacy is the name of the game. Since another military flare-up is unhelpful for Armenia and will lead to its blazing defeat. After all, the amount of military wherewithal Armenia has secured from countries like India, France, or even Greece is still no match to what Azerbaijan gets from Turkey and Israel in the trade-off whereby Israel sends abundant weapons to Baku in return for 60% of its oil needs from Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan. So let's put emotions aside momentarily and also put history on pause and think in serious realpolitik terms or strategically if you don't like the word realpolitik. Having agreed that the path available is one of diplomacy and that the alternative is far too perilous in my opinion, the parties in government and those in opposition should stop their pitiful wrangles, put aside their own ideological, or should I add egocentric skirmishes and agree to form an emergency national unity government. This is not a kumbaya moment but rather one of urgent necessity during this emergency period for the Republic, the only one Armenia we have today. Then, following, a delegation headed by the foreign minister with a team of diplomats should visit various EU countries, 
and not only those that like Armenia, plus the UN, Iran, Russia, the MENA and Gulf countries, Turkey, as well as the USA and the UK, to explain their present concerns as much as future hopes, scoping the political landscape. This is called canvassing in political speak. And explain what, you might well ask. Well, a whole range of consequences upon Armenia if it merely succumbs to Azerbaijani as well as Turkish and Russian dictates. For example, the hardships involved in the Russia-Georgia-Armenia oil pipeline supply if parts of these territories are handed to or controlled by Azerbaijan. After all, Tell me, what would prevent President Aliyev from disrupting oil supplies to Armenia as he did in Nagorno-Karabakh? Or consider the routes between Armenia and Georgia that would become so much more complicated and costly too. Or even if you wish, the isolation of the residents of the villages who have spent lifetimes developing their regions. Let us also keep in the back of our minds when we are pivoting away or toward one block or another, the incisive fact that Armenia's trade with Russia last year was 35%, whilst that with the EU was a mere 13%. So when we talk about an integrated Armenia-Georgia zone with interconnected electricity infrastructure and renewable energy, we cannot, by the same token, ignore that Armenia is still a member of the CSTO and the Eurasian Economic Union. And now, the key to my thinking. The national government should work toward a comprehensive deal with Azerbaijan that is contingent upon an agreement that defines and delimits the fluid Soviet borders. Don't enter into further concessions first. Put the horse before the cart, not the cart before the horse. Otherwise, you know what would happen? You'd end up with the horse bolting and a cart being good for nothing. Is all this easy or even just a little bit hard? Of course not. It is very hard and requires dedication, determination, and political resolve alongside the support of the Armenian electorate plus a majority of the international community. It could even fail, as I have witnessed in many other second track negotiations. But such a choice requires proper diplomats of the caliber of a skillful politician like the former foreign minister Vartan Oskanian, who are not bound by party politics, but rather by national interests. It also requires, by the way, the support of the Armenian diaspora. What Armenia and Armenians do not need is a war of attrition by different party-minded Armenians whose scope of political imagination remains, alas, disagreeably narrow. Finally, I know that many viewers will deride my schematic, but that's fine. However, my mood requires a relinquishment of I know better attitudes, starting with the prime minister himself, whose success in the revolution of April-May 2018, what was dubbed in Armenia as the hashtag Merjir Serjin Herapokuchun, does not give him carte blanche to decide alone the faith of a republic. Ditto with the defeated, corrupt, or discredited politicians who continue their derailment tactics. So good luck, Armenia. Good luck, Hayastan. As the Armenian-American novelist and playwright William Saroyan might have said or not said himself, I'll still aver 
that whenever two Armenians meet anywhere in our global village, they constitute a new Armenia. So, yep, it's a hard ask with very hard choices indeed. But politics is not a walk in the park. So good luck, Yevhachor Chun, Pororunus, anyway.